So hello, welcome, namaste. Those of you joining me in the room, those of you joining me on Zoom, and those of you listening to the recording afterwards. My name is Zach, and this is a little Dharma talk that I like to call Living from the Heart. I like to start with a poem of my own, go into the teaching and the topic for today, and finish off with a short meditation at the end, after which I'll turn off the recording and we can perhaps have a little, a little discussion and Q&A about anything that might have come up. So this poem is called Choose Love. When your son crashes the family car, the one you spent half your salary on, but gosh darn it, he made it out alive, choose love. When forgiveness comes knocking on your front door, but the doorknob is too hot to handle and you've been burned enough, see that you deserve more than a few thousand diamond rings and choose love. When the heat of anger boils over and you get so mad you could just find rest in the soft clouds of your own heart and choose love. When grief turns into a crashing tidal wave threatening to take you down with it, hold those that are close to you even closer and choose love. When failure is too close for comfort and no one questions your abilities more than you do, tune into the vibrations of the universe coursing through your veins and choose love. When for some crazy reason or any reason at all or no reason at all, you, you can't stand yourself, and you want to bang your head a few times on a brick wall until your brains fall out, try coloring that gray matter with a little pink and blue and choose love. When that boy doesn't call you back again and your heart feels like it's splattered across a car windshield, let the tightness in your chest explode into a million violet petals and choose love. Sometimes when something is broken, you have to break it further to put the pieces back together. And sometimes the gods envy you because you can hold your breath and create joys that fly over mountains like a good piano song or a sparkle in someone's eye. And today's topic is entitled, You Want Love, But Are You Ready For It? And I'll begin with a story. You know how the story goes. Once upon a time, there was an old man walking through the woods and he comes to a nice calm pond. And as soon as he comes to the pond, a frog swims up to him and says, oh my goodness, I'm so glad I found you. You see, I'm a beautiful princess. And if you give me a kiss, then we can live happily ever after. And this man, who's perhaps a little older in his years than your average prince, thinks about it for a few moments, picks up the frog, puts it in his pocket. Princess shouts, hey, what gives? Don't you want a beautiful princess in your life? And the man says, you know, at this point in my life, I think it'd be more interesting to have a talking frog. And I love a good story. I love good spiritual stories because, of course, at different times in our life, we can interpret it in different ways and we can extract more meaning the more times we hear it. And when I think of this story, I kind of think of two lessons that we can take from it. One is that love asks a lot of us. Love asks so much of us. And that's particularly what I want to talk about today. But also this basic idea that perhaps there is more to life and more to love than perhaps one single romantic partnership, or perhaps there's more to life than the fairy tale romantic partnership that we kind of grew up in. So we're gonna talk a lot about love today. And you might ask yourself, what exactly does love have to do with spirituality? And a good book that I tend to point towards is a book called Spiritual Evolution by the Harvard professor, George Vaillant. And the main thesis of the book is that spiritual practice and even religious practice has nothing to do with memorizing sacred texts and performing rote ritual. It has to do with two things, positive emotion and social connection. So I talk a lot about the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. And Sangha generally means community. 
and that none of us can do this alone. And I was reading an older translation of the Buddhist text, and this was a European scholar who had translated uh, these words, and he translated the word sangha to mean church. I thought, hmm, that's a very interesting way to translate community. But of course, there are ways we even use the word church to mean community, such as, oh, you just lost your job? Well, don't worry, the church will help you. Or have you asked the church for guidance? This basic idea that we are here to support each other. And a sangha isn't just like your lo local bridge club or golfing buddies. Your sangha is a community of like-minded spiritual practitioners who are walking the path along with you. So we have the role of social connection. So regardless of say, whatever deity you might believe in to go to once a week, you are meeting with a group once a week that can see you, support you, honor, recognize you. And being seen and honored and loved is the deepest human need. So that social connection is a strong cohesive force in any spiritual community. Now, the other main argument is that spiritual practice is rooted in positive emotion. And I, don't, I know I certainly have found this in my life. If you want to learn about pain and suffering and what can go wrong in the human condition, science has done a really good job at that. You can get the DSM, the a psychology Bible, and you can read all about the mental illnesses, and you can become a doctor and learn all about the things that can go wrong in the body. But even the positive psychology movement is fairly young, fairly new, 10, 20, 30 years old. Meanwhile, if you want to learn about gratitude and awe, and forgiveness, and wonder, and happiness, and joy, and ecstasy, and love, I tend to find you will find much more rich discussions about these topics in the church, in the temple, in the yoga studio, than you might in a lecture hall down the street, for example, at UC Berkeley. Now, the Greater Good Science Center does a lot of these things. A lot of the scientific community is coming around to the role that positive emotions play in our life. But we also have thousands of years of texts and wisdoms and teachings to draw upon on how we can be more happy, more joyful, more present, and more loving in our life. So do we have any Jack Kornfield fans here, started Spirit Rock Meditation Center. So Jack Kornfield put it this way. All other spiritual teachings are in vain if we cannot love. Even the most exalted states and the most exceptional spiritual accomplishments are unimportant. If we cannot be happy in the most basic and ordinary ways, if with our hearts, we cannot touch one another and the life we have been given. What matters is how we live. We must make certain our path is connected with our heart. In beginning any genuine spiritual journey, we have to stay much closer to home, to focus directly on what is right here in front of us, to make sure that our path is connected with our deepest love. So our relationships are an incredible container for our healing, growth, and transformation, particularly because they will point out all the ways that you are stuck. This is what I often call the trap of relationships. So the way human beings have evolved to fall in love with one another is first we perhaps see somebody that we are potentially attracted to. And it's that lust, which is the first stage. And then eventually we fall in love. And I like to say that what most people think of love is just the beginning of love, the butterflies in the stomach being swept off your feet that can't wait to hear the text back from this person. You might also call this limerence. You might call it a new relationship energy. Uh, some psychologists even call it a temporary psychosis that we experience when we fall in love with somebody, when we think we have just met the most perfect person ever in our entire life. And <laughs> yes, and the perfect person for us and how lucky we are. So we tend to call this idealistic love. 
And while certain aspects of it can definitely last a lifetime, there are people that report the feeling of butterflies in their stomach whenever they see their partner for their entire life. In general, like a lot of things in life, these don't last and these feelings don't last. And it's probably a good thing that the obsessive feelings 24 seven about somebody don't last though we can focus on other parts of our life. But then we approach usually about one to three years into a relationship what psychologists call the power struggle stage. What I like to call the transition from idealistic love to realistic love. That you don't have the most perfect person ever because there isn't the most perfect person ever. You have a person just as imperfect and wounded as you. And it's at this point in the relationship where the real work of love begins. Now, a lot of people, this isn't when they cut and run. So when you look at when most relationships end, it tends to be at that mark, that one, two, three year mark, where suddenly the real work of love begins because love asks a lot of us. So not only do we experience this shift, but it almost like evolution almost like traps us. And I say this in a very positive way because we're being trapped into healing and growth and transformation. We've already made the promises. We've already made the pillow talk. We've already said, you're just the most perfect person for me. You maybe even moved in together and now they put the milk in the fridge the wrong way. Now the dishes are not put away in the correct way. Suddenly all these little triggers, all these little wounds get pressed on. And then the real work of love begins. So there's a line, two couples are in therapy and one says to the other, but I love you. And the other one replies, don't threaten me. It's a lot. Love asks a lot of us. And just to combine that story with another line, later on, they're still arguing. And one person says to the other one, well, the Dalai Lama didn't have to deal with you. Okay, I'll give you one more since you like that one. Sometimes when we meet somebody, we think that we can cure their suffering. And when we can't, we marry them. So therapists have found that we all essentially marry our unfinished business. So part of our task, of course, is to finish your business. So you probably heard that story or that line from Ram Das that if you think you're enlightened, go spend a week with your family. I think that can also apply it to our romantic relationships. If you think that you're enlightened, that you are at peace with all things, speak with your partner about something challenging. So there's a famous story of a Zen master named Su Dong Po. And he wrote a poem expressing just how enlightened he had become. And his poem went, I bow my head to the heaven within heaven, hairline rays illuminating the universe. The eight winds cannot move me, sitting still upon the purple golden lotus. So the eight winds has strong symbolism. You might've heard the eight winds of fame and disrepute, blame and gain, fame, and, uh, gain and loss, fame, disrepute. Basically, these are the eight worldly winds that affect us, and Su Dong Po thinks that they don't. So impressed by his own poem, Su Dong Po sent a servant to hand carry his poem to his friend across the lake to another Zen master, Fo Yin. He was sure that his friend would be equally impressed. When his poem returned, his friend found the word fart written across the letter with large words. He was shocked. He burst into anger. How dare he insult me like this, that lousy monk. He's got a lot of explaining to do. So full of agitation, he rushed out of his house, went into his boat, ferried across the river, went to his friend's house as quickly as possible, to which he's found a sign on the door of his friends. And it says, the eight winds cannot move me, but one fart blows me across the river. So it's easy, you know, on our meditation cushion to have certain experiences of peace, and perhaps ecstasy, perhaps even grand visions. But of course, as John Cornfield would say, the real work, the real spiritual practice is loving right here and right now. And this requires looking at our own stuff. 
So I often point out that even the word for meditation or the Tibetan word for meditation is gom, which means to become familiar with. It is a familiarization. We are tuning within, shining a mirror, highlighting our own internal worlds and getting in touch with our own neuroses and our own triggers and our own wounds so that we can then heal from these patterns. Because if we don't heal from these unconscious patterns, they will continue to rule our life. So the same reason why we marry our unfinished business is that we do have these emotional blueprints. You might call it a model of self. You might call it an attachment pattern. Basically, we have all sorts of imprints from early on in our life. In Sanskrit, in Sanskrit we call them samskaras, latent impressions of the mind. Almost the same way if you were like sledding down a hill with freshly fallen snow, each time you slide down, a little imprint happens, a little path gets formed. You slide down enough that imprint again, it goes deeper and deeper and deeper. So too, we have latent impressions of the mind. You might call it mental patterns or emotional conditioning that we find ourselves going down the same route again and again. So when we do close our eyes and notice our thoughts, we realize just how often they're on repeat, right? As Mark Twain says, I had 10,000 thoughts today, 9,999 of them I had yesterday. We all have mental imprints, mental conditioning, unconscious patterns of which we are barely cogn cognizant of, and our task is to break free of them, to find true freedom. And it's not easy to look at our own stuff, right? We're, they're called shadows for a reason. They're in the darkness. We prefer not to look at them. So we have all sorts of coping strategies to avoid the necessary work that we have to do. For example, you walk into the doctor's office. The doctor says, I'm very sorry, you have cancer. And you say, well, that's ridiculous. I want a second opinion. The doctor says, well, you're ugly too. It's like, no matter what strategies we try to do to avoid the suffering, it's going to come around again. And this is why having a consistent, for example, intimate partnership, and this can happen with lots of people, but consistent intimate partnership consistently puts us in touch with our own stuff. So relationships are very much mirrors, encouraging us to look at our own stuff. Often we look at the mirror, there's blood on our face, uh, not blood, that's a little violent mud on our face <laughs> sounds a little better a little bit of mud on our face and what do we do we blame the mirror we think the mirror is what's muddy rather than acknowledge the meat the mirror is simply pointing out our own stuff so blame is a wonderful way to abdicate oneself of any responsibility here's another story for you a man is on his deathbed He's talking to his wife and he says, Helen, we've been through so much together. Do you remember when the shop weren't burned down and we lost everything of value we had in this world? We had to start over from nothing, but you were by my side. His wife replied, I remember, dear. Helen, when our son was killed in that terrible car accident, I was heartbroken. I didn't think I could go on, but you were right there by my side. His wife began to cry. I know, dear, I know. And now the man says, I'm about to leave this world, and in my final moments, you're right by my side. To which she said, yes, I'm right here. Finally, the man said, Helen, I'm beginning to think that you might be bad luck. <laughs> It's easy to have somebody to just blame for all of our problems, yes? So sometimes we say your partner is not the cause of nor the solution to all of your problems. So another reason why relationships and this work of love is so amazing for healing, growth, and transformation is it turns us it turns love into a practice. So in psychology, we call this re-romanticizing. In other words, never stop dating your partner. Chogyam Trumpa says that there is never a dull moment when you are in touch with reality as it is. 
a huge reason we have that new relationship energy at the beginning of a relationship is because of novelty, because everything is new. Oh, you like sushi? I love sushi. Here we are on this voyage of discovery together. But it's very easy to get complacent, to feel like you have the same old partner after the same old day. But another thing we do to train uh, the mind in our meditation practice is to be present. And as soon as we become present, we realize there is never a dull moment when we are in touch with reality as it is. That everything is constantly changing all the time. I forgot who said this line, but it basically says, you cannot love, but you are not consistently discovering anew. You might even feel like your life is in a rut. You know, you have the same job every single day, same house every single day, same blank every single day. And this is, of course, because we aren't being fully present to our experience. We don't discover how all the wonders of life are here, how every day offers 24 brand new hours. No day is ever repeated. So even if we focus on the breath as it flows in and out for 30 minutes, 30 days, 30 years, no breath is ever the same. No day is ever the same. Even in this simple talk, I've already, uh, we've only been, what, 20 minutes? A million blood cells in your body have died and a million blood cells in your body have been reborn. Even you are changing. Yes, the person who enters this room will not be the same person that leaves this room. So if you find yourself getting in those habitual reactions or even feeling like things are the same old, same old, it's simply because you're not paying attention to how everything changes. And that is another thing that we do in our practice. We train the mind to be present, to see how every moment is new and to see each moment as one of discovery. And again, I'm saying this like it's easy because it's not. Another story, a couple stories today, a man and a woman are sitting on the couch. You don't even have to gender it. We can just say one turns to the, to the other and says, you know, if I'm ever in a vegetative state, if I'm ever brain dead, I just want you to pull the plug to which the other partner gets up and unplugs the television. So this is the process of awakening. Even the Buddha, so we talk about Buddha Dharma Sangha, Buddha is simply a title. It simply means awakened one. And I always love the etymology that bud, just like the bud in a flower, means to awaken. So we're here to awaken from the trance. And I often use this story. I'm surprised how few people know of this phenomenon, but if you take a chicken and you put its beak in the ground and you draw a line with chalk or even just a finger, a line in the dirt, it will basically be hypnotized by that line and you'll release and it just falls over. And they think it's a flight freeze response because it thinks it's a snake. So it just freezes and falls over. And I'm like, yeah, it's so like, you know, when you draw a line in front of the chicken, everyone's like, what? That's a thing? <laughs> it's like, okay, I have to find a new metaphor for how we're all transfixed. We're all transfixed in a hypnotic state with this life. And our practice is to awaken. So this is why I love how Adi Ashanti describes spirituality as the art of listening. So in yoga, we even have a saying, listen to your body's whispers now so that you don't have to hear it yell later. You know, if you've got that creaky knee, the pain in the back, that's a sign. We tend to push away pain and discomfort, and in so doing, we're unable to understand it. But once we understand it, we're like, ah, yes, this is what I need to do to correct this back pain to fix my knee so that it doesn't turn into a knee replacement or herniated disc later. Well, we can extrapolate this to all other sorts of areas of your life. You should listen to your heart's whispers now so that you don't have to hear it yell later. When you find yourself, for example, 20 years into a marriage or a job or your hometown and realizing that you're simply not fulfilled because you haven't been listening to your heart. So too, we can listen to our partner's whispers now so that we don't have to hear them yell later. Maybe they say, you know what? I'm a bit unhappy with our relationship. Oh, it's fine. 
Okay, well, that's going to turn into greater conflict down the road. So we are increasing our capacity to be with what is in our meditation practice. So a huge inquiry that does tend to come up when people sit for any extended period of time is what do I do about this pain? What do I do about, you know, it hurts my hip, it hurts my knee, it hurts my back a little bit. And the general rule of thumb is it's okay, you can move. If you go to a Zen temple, they're going to hit you with a stick if you even begin to slouch. But in most other communities, you're allowed to move. That being said, we are, we, all, we are also increasing our capacity to be with what is, which includes increasing our capacity to be with discomfort. So before you move, just like meditation is noticing the itch without scratching it, so too, notice, huh, there is pain here. What is pain? What is my relationship to pain? Does this pain have colors, textures, shapes? Does it move? Is it permanent? Does it shift? And a lot of the time, you'll just find it move along. You'll find it pass, as all things will. But there's a big difference between a 30-minute meditation and being in pain for 30 minutes. So obviously, moving, lying down, sitting, standing are all things that you can do. But we are here to listen. So just as we listen to our breath, we listen to our heart, we listen to our body, we can also even use sound as an object of concentration in our meditation practice. So because we have this monkey mind always jumping from thought branch to thought branch, early on in a meditation practice, it's generally recommended to pick an object of concentration, which is just something you bring the mind back to whenever you notice it wander. So the breath is a very common object of concentration to bring the mind back to when you notice it wander. But I'd like to point out, it doesn't work for everyone. Certain people have a uh, certain anxiety around being with the breath. Suddenly you like focus on the breath and they were, am I breathing right? I don't know. And they start, things start to get a little bit uh, anxious. So sound, sound actually is a wonderful way to be present, to just notice all the sounds that are around you, to practice this art of listening, which of course does involve dropping out of the future, dropping out of the present, to drop, dropping out of the past, to drop into the present. So Mark Nepo put, puts it this way, to listen is to continually give up all expectation and to give our attention completely and freshly to what is before us not really knowing what we will hear or what that will mean. In the practice of our days, to listen is to lean in softly with a willingness to be changed by what we hear. So this is the work of love, looking at all the obstacles that prevent us from meeting our intention to love. A huge part of that is regulation. Being able, just as we are able to notice the itch without scratching it, we are slowly shifting to be able to notice the emotions that are coursing through our inner experience without getting so caught up in them, right? There's a big difference between I am angry and identifying with the anger to saying I'm feeling anger arise in my body to, oh, I'm noticing anger because Perhaps a boundary has been crossed. It's perfectly reasonable to fear, feel anger about certain things. But as my kindergarten teacher used to, used to say, there's a difference between being angry and throwing chairs. Right? So we can notice the anger, but we turn to our intention to love. And this is what it means to choose love. So you probably know that quote by Viktor Frankl, that in between the stimulus and the response, there is a space, and within that space, there lies our freedom. So that is another thing that we are here to do, that we are here to cultivate. We're here to widen that space, to give ourselves greater freedom to choose love, to respond with love, understanding, and compassion, rather than react with anger or hostility. One partner says to the other, sorry, I can't hear you over the sound of how right I am. Yeah. This is listening. It also requires letting go, letting go of our own 
need and desire to be right, or even our own opinions, in order to, as Mark Nepo would say, be changed by what we hear. So this is the work of love. There's a phrase I learned from mindful self-compassion trainings, that love reveals everything unlike itself. Love reveals everything unlike itself. So when you start to apply unconditional love, for example, to yourself, you will begin to feel, experience, and notice all the situations and ways that you were unloved and that you aren't perhaps loving yourself in the most way, in the, in the best way. So this is, again, love asks a lot of us. So we have to be willing to be changed by what we hear, to look at our wounds, to look at our shadows, to look at our reactions to things, to seek emotional regulation. And this is a path of transformation. This poem is called The Path of Love. And here I thought the path of love would look like love, like kindness, like generosity, like gentleness, Instead, it looks like me being bothered by the sound of loud chewing. Me wanting praise. Me needing to feel loved. Hello, me. How elegantly love has arranged for me to meet all the parts of me that would stand in love's way. How easily it shows me I've thought of love as a destination. But here is love with no expectation. Here is love with no name, no locus. Here is love with no face, no shape, no promise, no vow, no hope. Here is love as itself, surging and flowing. Love as itself, insisting on love. Love as itself, eroding all those layers of me that still think they know something about love. And love holds me while I rail. And love throws me back in the stream. And love is what is still here when I am not. So part of our path of shifting from idealistic or fairy tale love to realistic love is embracing imperfections, which is not easy to do. Human beings are incredible at finding imperfections. You've probably heard of the if-only mind, which is another thing we can go, another thing we can become familiar with, is how the mind robs ourselves of being happy in the here and now by thinking if only. If only life were to happen in this way, if only things were to be this certain way, then I could be happy, then I could find peace. And we see it a lot too at... Uh, yoga studios, I'll say, people think, oh, I could find peace, but I need a vacation. I need to go to some island somewhere and be in a hammock and have all my needs taken care of. Then, then I'll be able to meditate. But we know we're here to look at our triggers. If you can't meditate in a boiler room, you can't meditate. If you can't practice while you are sick, you cannot practice while you are healthy. So we're here to look at this, look at those imperfections, look at the if only mind that continuously finds fault. There's a story of a little boy who was swallowed by a tidal wave while he was playing on the beach. His grandma looked up to heaven and pled for God to bring her grandson back. Finally, an incoming, an incoming wave brought the boy back safe and sound. The grandma hugged him looked at him and said, hey, he had a hat on. Even great miracles can happen to her life, but is it enough? Is there an imperfection? Did it not go exactly the way that we wanted it to? So John Wellward says he has that book, Perfect Love, Imperfect Relationships. And he writes, who is it that's unhappy? the one who finds fault. Hmm. Jules Pfeiffer wrote this. 
I grew up to have my father's looks, my father's speech patterns, my father's posture, my father's opinions, and my mother's contempt for my father. And I like that quote. And at first glance, when I heard this quote, I told it to my parents one time, they didn't like it. Um, but I interpret it to be self-criticism and self-hatred. Like I grew up my father's looks, speech patterns, posture, and then I had this contempt and I had this contempt for myself. And that's certainly something I think we probably have all experienced, certain self-criticism, self-hatred. We're often way more critical of ourselves than anybody else. If somebody talked to us the way that we talk to ourselves, we'd probably wouldn't be friends with them. We probably would tell them, show them the door, right? But the interesting thing about shadows and our shadow elements is what psychology has found is that when we ignore our shadows, we project them onto other people. So what will most likely happen if you have absorbed, for example, your mother's contempt for your father, you will project contempt onto your partner because we have these relational blueprints or imprints or samskaras. And we're here to awaken from them. We're here to break free of them. Hmm. Want a lot of time for practice. So I think I'll have to save this idea of a more expansive or a different kind of love for next week because I want to imply, I want to talk about one more obstacle that we have to loving, which is the risk that is involved, which if you are risking love, you are also risking loss. So Jita Krishnamurti says, a mind that is seeking security can never know what love is. So this is why there is the work of love because we cannot love and live life according to our own terms. We are continually meeting another person's reality, another person's will, another person's emotional world that can be vastly different than our own. And this is something we discover in our meditation practice, essentially, is that there is no ground to stand on. We're here to let go of it all. The, superior, the superiority complex, the inferiority complex, and the equality complex. Meditation is often described as jumping out of an airplane, realizing you have no parachute, looking down, realizing there is no ground, and then realizing no one actually jumped. We are here to let go of it all. All our rigidly held beliefs, opinions, likes, dislikes, desire to judge in order to find true freedom. So you will not be able to fully love or take the risk of love if you're looking for security because nothing lasts. This is what people say in couples counseling. You're not the person I married. Well, I would hope not. I hope you're always learning. I hope you're always growing. I hope you're always discarding parts of yourself that no longer serve like a snake shedding its skin in order to step into new, more powerful, more loving, more kind versions of yourself. A man's talking to his wife and he's you know, reading some ancient texts like the Upanishads and he says, honey, what's this reincarnation thing I've heard about? And his wife goes, oh, that means when you die, you can get reborn as something completely different. He goes, wow, really? So I could come back as a pig? He goes, she goes, no, you idiot. I said something completely different. Yes, I hope you're not with the person that you married, right? I hope that you're both changed, that you have evolved, that you have shed the seeds, the hardened shell, shells around the fertile growth of love that needs to happen in your life. So again, Chogyakam Trumpa says, Rear, uh, real fearlessness is the product of tenderness. It comes from letting the world tickle your heart, your raw and beautiful heart. You are willing to open up 
without resistance or shyness and face the world. You are willing to share your heart with others. So a metaphor we often use is that of armor. It's normal to not want to feel pain, to not want to get hurt, but nothing in this life will protect you from sickness, old age, death, and loss. In this changing and permanent world, we will experience loss. And it is normal to not want to feel that again and to put up armor. But what does armor do? We're yogis, we know it's heavy, restricts our movement. And while we think it protects us, it creates separation. It creates disconnection. So we are here to remove the armor. And within such a transformation, we will find a lightness and a joy and a freedom that was always there. So that's it. Mm. Finding your comfortable position, could be sitting, could be lying down, could be standing. And take a few minutes to listen. Tune on your ears, hear all the sounds around you. And then shift your attention from outward to inward. Listen inwardly. Does the heart have anything to say? Does the body have anything to say? And our love is communicated with attention, no agenda, no judgment, simply presence and listening. So we can even tell ourselves, darling, I am here for you. You might feel called to put your hand on your heart or even hand on the belly if that's a place that might need some love and attention. You might even add a recognition of suffering. Darling, I know that you are suffering. And that is why I am here for you.
And as we notice, be with and listen to the heart space. Perhaps we can even smile at the heart. I've done a lot of meditations. A lot of meditation teachers tell you to notice the breath or notice the heart. But you can also enjoy the breath. Enjoy the heart. Smile at the breath. Smile at the heart. As we finish with a few deep breaths, find and infuse some positive emotion with the breath. If you are breathing, it means you are alive, feeling grateful for this life. With each breath, we take in the world and the exhalation of trees and plants, and we exchange it back feeling that connection. And finding that tender, open, loving presence. That metta, loving kindness that is like a gentle rain, touches everything. where mindfulness meets the world with appreciation. And in this practice of love, we can even love the parts of ourselves that have a hard time loving parts of ourselves, encompassing it all. Here is love as itself, surging and flowing. Love as itself, insisting on love. Love as itself, eroding all those layers of me that still think they know something about love. Love holds me while I rail. And love throws me back in the stream. And love is what is still here when I am not. And may the benefits of our practice be for all sentient beings everywhere. For we are not free until all beings are free. And I thank you for sharing your practice and presence with me today. Namaste.